Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We've been waiting on you. We're ready to get cracking here, finish this book of 2 Thessalonians. We're going to take chapter 3 today. I think probably that second chapter written to the, the Thessalonians is one of the most important chapters. Very hard to say this, but I think it's one of the most important chapters in the Word of God because it really gives you in detail, if you'll take the time to understand it, the chronological order of events with the subject having been in the books of Thessalonians, the return or second advent of Jesus Christ. You want to know how it's going to happen? Read the second chapter. Read all of the Thessalonians, but it really is nailed down for you in that second chapter. Again, the subject still continues. The returning of Jesus Christ and what it is you're supposed to do. How you behave yourself. We go basically into a doctrinal chapter which tells you how to get along with relatives and so on and so forth in the completion and it really plies over the overall of knowing the chronological order of events. I guarantee you it's good counsel. Listen to it. Chapter 3, a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name. Verse 1 and it reads, Finally, brethren, in other words, this is in conclusion, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course. That is to say that it's free to run, free to spread, free to touch people, and be glorified even as it is with you. You know, I want you to stop for a moment and I want you to analyze that in your mind because you can see what kind of person Paul is. Did he say pray for us because we're in peril? Did he say pray for us because we're in danger? Did he say pray for us because we're hungry? No, he said pray for us that the word of the Lord could go forth. That's, he didn't mind the stripes. I'm sure he minded, but it was no, no consequence to spreading the Word of God. So what I want you to see is see inside Paul's heart there and see why he was zealous. That was his innermost thought, was spreading or taking forward the Word of God. Verse 2, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith. In other words, there are some out there that do not love the Lord. And if they get a chance to use you or do you, they're going to. So be on guard. And uh, as he would say, I would, um, I would say that pray that you be delivered from them. Do you know how you are delivered from them? You've got to be smarter than they are. How do, you, how do you come to be smarter than they are? All wisdom comes from God's Word. And within this weaves, is woven rather, the framework that brings blessings in your life and causes you to be successful or what are you? Okay? Now, it's you that must decide what you choose for yourself and how you react to it. But there are people out there that will hurt you. There are people out there that do not love the Lord that will take advantage of you. Now, why am I hammering this just a little bit? Well, unfortunately, we have some teachers that go far too far the other way, and they take the scriptures that were written to teachers. That is to say, men that God was sending forth, that Christ was sending out to preach the gospel. And he said, if you get too carried away and you dump on some preacher and offend him and he slaps you or some individual because of his religion, turn the other cheek. 
And, and uh, in their ignorance of God's word, they take that and say you should deal even with these unruly, um, ungodly people. That's not what he said. That's not what he intended. They will take advantage of you. And Christians are not second-class citizens. We are first-class citizens. Do you know what the word Christian means? It means Christ man. Do you know what the word Christ means? It means the anointed. Anointed with what? The all of our people. The anointed tribe. The anointed people. Anointed means selected. They are to look out for each other, but at the same time, watch out for the family. For those that do not love the Lord, they're out there, okay? Now, what if it happens to be someone in your own family? Well, he's going to tell you. Listen to it. Verse 3. But the Lord is faithful. You can count on him. I will never leave you nor forsake you. The Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil or from the wicked one or the evil one. The subject was Satan's going to come first. The Lord is faithful. He will establish you. Do you know what the word establish means? It means to anchor you, to give you a platform, to give you a mindset whereby you cannot be deceived and that you know how to stand against the evil one, the wicked one. You know how to protect your family. Okay, verse 4. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. Concerning the wicked one, we know God is going to touch you and bless you. You don't, you don't have, you know, if someone that is new into the word as, well, will God always bless me? Well, if you deserve it, yes, because he's very true and very fair. But you must meet the conditions. There are a lot of ifs. I will do this, that, or the other. I'll claim that. No, you forgot to read the next word. It said, if uh, you do a certain thing for him. So uh, God will touch you. He will stand with you. He will establish you, mean anchor your life whereby you can have that stability in your life and not be like some reed shaken in the wind blowing from one way to the other. Verse 5, and the Lord direct your hearts, that's to say your minds. Did you know that God will help your mind? That's what this means. The, the Lord direct your heart or mind into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Hey, why would he say patient waiting for Christ because the subject in this book has been a lot are going to jump the gun and go with the false Christ. They're not going to, God will prepare your mind whereby you know the false Christ is coming first and that establishes you as one of God's election when you know that and you're not playing games, you accept it as reality for it is and are willing to make a stand for the truth rather than being blown from one direction to the other by the first whim or, or evangelist that comes along with some happy saying. God's word is sufficient. This is why God would, Paul would pray in that first verse of this chapter, and I love it so much, that pray for us that the word may spread. Why? Because it saves our people a lot of embarrassment especially in this generation, for it's not going to be very popular on the first day of the millennium to realize you were whoring after Antichrist, Satan. Makes you about as popular as a hair in a biscuit and feeling a lot worse. They even pray for the mountains to fall on them. Let's help people escape that by the loose lips of those that would uh, espouse the traditions of men that make void the Word of God. God wants to touch you. He wants to use you. He wants to touch your mind to give you that stability and establish you whereby He can count on you. 
Okay, let's go on to the next verse. Now we command you. Now here, you don't want to command. That means this is an order. This, this is important. We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is from him, in his name, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother. You know what a brother is? That means a Christian brother, even. That you withdraw from every brother that walketh disorderly. That means uh, irregular, um, unarranged. Unarranged in what? The Word of God. Doesn't know anything about the Word of God. Just blabs off his mouth and blows a lot of hot air and pretends to be a teacher. You separate yourself from such as that. That's why he would say if, if that particular group happens to be the arm of the church, get away from it. It's better that you would lose that arm of the church than go to hell yourself. Get away from them. Separate yourself. <clears throat> it's, um, it is strange, but of course the word uh, also disorderly plays on laziness people that won't work truly at spreading the word. Verse 7, for yourselves know how you ought to follow us. That you, I would rather translate this, imitate us. Pray that prayer that he prayed at request in verse 1, that the word, the word of God, not our word, not my word, not your word, but the word of God could spread around the world in truth and imitate that. Paul says, imitate what we do. For we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. We weren't loafing. We weren't out chasing around or anything of that nature when we were there among you bringing forth the word of God. We behaved ourselves. We set a good example. Imitate that when you take the word forward. Verse 8, neither did we eat any man's bread for naught. We paid our way. But wrought, that is to say, we worked with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you, uh, that we wouldn't be an expense to you. You know, Paul, I, I like his way, and that's why I've never taken a salary in almost 50 years of teaching. Never taken a salary because I enjoy doing the work too much. And I would, uh, the reason being, I want people to know why I'm in this. It's not for money, it's for spreading the word of God. Now, is there anything wrong, by another word, but let's back to Paul. Paul was a tent maker. Paul worked, made his own way, no big deal. You know, if, if you decide to take that course, God will always bless your mind and your hands till you'll be one of the best business people around. You'll know how to do, what to do, when to do. Our Father takes care of his own because he will touch you. Do you want him to touch you? Then follow the command. Separate yourself from those that are uh, especially planned to see that God's word isn't followed. And my friends, a brother means born of the same womb even, means family. Well, is God being a little hard there? No, that's called tough love. He'll give us a better opinion here. Let's go to the next verse, verse nine. Not because we have not power, not because we don't have the right to take salary from you or, or um, uh, uh, food, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us, to imitate us, to do it that way. That way there can be no question. Now, if you think for one moment that I am saying that no minister should ever take a salary. You're mistaken. A servant is worthy of his hire. That is God's law, okay? 
A minister has every right in the world to take a salary. As a matter of fact, he must support his family in some way. And uh, if he does not have the faith or the energy to make his own way, then he should take a salary, if he be God called. Okay? That's not what I'm saying. And I'm saying that because I don't want to put some church board, deacon board on the preacher's case to, to tell him his salary's cut off, which that's not going to happen, but be that as it may. You have the right. Uh, every servant is worthy of his hire, but there come times that Paul was an exceptional person. We have to uh, 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 see that, to understand it. He wanted to make a point. He, having written a very large part of the New Testament, he is certainly one you can imitate. Verse 10. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. I mean, saw his end of the table off. Cut off his way right there. If he won't work, sorry, son, you're out. Well, that's tough. Yeah, it's tough love. But you know something? It's God's command and it works. Verse 11, for we hear that there be, for we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly. They're lazy. Working not at all, but are busybodies. Just gossip, gossip, gossip. I mean, just gossip all the time. Why? They're not busy. Yeah. Uh, unbusy hands and mouths can get into trouble. Now, let someone think, you know, that you've, um, well, my boy is 35 years old and he doesn't know how to work and he won't leave home. And if I were to not feed him, he might starve. Uh-uh. You did not create his body. God's nature of the womb of the mother created the body. It's just, it's, it's really awesome. For there's a little micro switch between the navel, the belly button, and the backbone. And when the belly button gets real close to the backbone, called starvation, the old boy gets this unction in his mind, I think I need to go to work. All right? So don't, don't worry, he won't die on you. But he'll, he'll find out what life is about. So I, I can, that's good advice. Use it wisely with love. You must understand, tough love issued in bitterness is bad. Tough love um, issued in love is a beautiful thing. I guarantee you one thing, there is one sad thing about tough love. In a sense, it always hurts the disciplinarian more than it does the one being disciplined. That's kind of the sad part, but the rewards of it, seeing the the outcome is well worth it. You know, as, as disciplinarians, sometimes we have to stand tough. And yeah, it's going to hurt a little bit. But lessons must be learned. A family without discipline is a family in trouble. A city without discipline is a city in trouble. A school without discipline is a school in trouble. A church without discipline is worthless because it can't teach people how to discipline themselves or their family. Discipline is why we have disciples. The word comes from discipline. It's to discipline yourself in a teaching, in a study, in the commandments of God, whereby your family receives the blessings that the scriptures promise. Otherwise, hey, don't try to claim a promise that God makes if you're not willing to, to toe the mark and put out the work because you're not going to get it. God doesn't do freebies. You know why? Because it spoils people. The greatest, easiest way in the world that you can spoil people is to do freebies for them all the time. And I hope you understand what my terminology is. That means to, to cover for someone all the time. Forget it, friend. It's a tough old world out there, and, and uh, they need to face it. Gossip, of course, is... Well, unfortunately, it can run very rampant 
among preachers. <gasps> you mean preachers gossip? I sure do. I mean bad. Uh, that's why you want to be careful about confessing your most <laughs> personal sins to some of them. I, you know, I'm a living example of what a bunch of gossips and liars they can be. Because so-called Christian organizations have spread lies about this ministry that anyone that listens to it for one hour knows it's not true. I don't know, uh, you know, Satan is the father of liars and always will be. So gossipers have to do something to try to create uneasiness among people. And it always goes back to, I had a question in the last lecture about Susanna. The people run around, did you hear what Susanna did? We have two witnesses that Susanna, who is engaged to this man, met this tall young man out under a tree. And they, whatever, right there under that tree. Did you hear about Susanna? All over town it went. Do you know what the real truth of it was? Is these two Kenites wanted Susanna. And they told her, you will either lie with us or we're going to spread the rumor that you were under that tree with a young man from where we don't know. She run them out of the garden. And they spread the story and the town loved it. Have you heard about Susanna? People love that kind of stuff. And do you know who happened to be walking out when they were about ready to kill Susanna? They were going to sentence her to death. And Daniel walked out of the building and said, what do you think, Daniel? Did you hear about Susanna? And he said, no, I didn't. I don't know anything about this. I don't think you got to the root of it. And they said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, send one of those people out here. One of those Canaan, the Kenites is what they were. Send one out and take the other back in the house. And he said, son, Point to me which tree you saw this deed play, pl take play. Oh, well, I, it was under that sycamore right there. He said, now take him back in and bring me the other one. The other one came out and he said, son, tell me what tree did you see this take place? And he says, under that oak right there. And Daniel says, hang both of them. Okay. So you see, truth is a beautiful thing. But gossip is poison, and some people so love it. So a worthless, lazy bum that won't work and, and causes trouble to try to draw attention away from himself, blaming things on other people, is a very unpleasant person to be around if you're not careful, okay? And, and that's, that's truth. I'm not saying that to criticize some misguided soul, but it'll, it's, it's nothing but trouble, and trouble going somewhere to happen. Okay, verse 12 to continue. Are we, did we get that? Yes, here we go. Now then, that, now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, by his word, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. In other words, don't be gossiping. Eat your own bread and do your own work. And so it is. Okay, verse 13. But we, brethren, be not weary, but ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. That is to say, in doing what's right. Do you know something? In this generation especially, I think it's very easy for someone when you get your old toes stepped on often enough in doing what's right because you've got so many crooks in the world and uh, it's even hard for good politicians to operate because of bad politicians. You know what a bad politician will do? He'll commit a criminal act in one year and then turn around in the next year and say, I've had a change of heart. I think we should really stamp out that particular act and do it a different way. Maybe it's like raising money in churches. I don't know. It's illegal. You would think that anybody in politics would know it's illegal to raise money in a church. We can't even mention a, um, 
it's got to be a nonpartisan issue before a preacher can even talk about politics. Okay? But uh, when politicians go to churches, I mean, absolutely go to churches to raise money, uh, and, and, you know, an honest preacher can't even say anything about it, or an honest politician usually doesn't say too much. But, you know, wise people know and understand things pretty good. But that's the way busybodies work. They can sure spread rumors, do what's wrong, and then just come out, just chain, put on a new white suit and get rid of the dirty old thing and say, ain't I pretty? White is driven as snow, and their hands are bloody. Okay? Whoa. It's amazing, but I, people can get tired of doing what's right, but don't you ever dare do it, beloved. You always do what's right, and you protect your name. Your name is the best thing you will ever have. Keep it clean, protect it, and always do what's right. Do you know why? You don't have to worry. God, will he'll catch up with them. He'll take care of it. So don't, don't grow tired of doing what's right when sometimes it's mistaken. Don't be discouraged in doing what's right. Verse 14, and if any man obey not our word by this epistle, by this, this book, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Ashamed of what? Ashamed of himself. 15, but listen carefully, yet count him not as an enemy. He's not your enemy. He's your brother. He's your family. But admonish him as a brother. You warn him. All, you know, this even goes to correcting children. Never correct a child that you don't explain why you're doing it. You know, that can really confuse a child if you just grab one up and whop it and start yelling at it, telling it it's no good and stupid. What is the ch child to think? Well, if it's got a stupid parent like that, maybe yeah, that's the reason it's stupid. And the children, children are not stupid. Teach them. Discipline is an art of teaching. All, uh, children are very intelligent, always explain, but never treat a family member especially like an enemy. Set yourself apart, warn them, admonish them, but don't treat them as an enemy. That's going too far in tough love. Okay, you got it? The reason I want to stress that is that is the parameter God has placed on tough love. Practice tough love, but don't treat your family like an enemy. Got it? Okay, verse 16. Now the Lord of peace himself Give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. Do you know what this means? It's really a deep saying. To have peace from the Lord means you have peace of mind. That's peace in your family, peace in your own mind, and peace in your neighborhood because you are disciplined in the Word of God. And basically, you understand First and Second Thessalonians concerning the chronological order of events. That is to say, how things are going down. And as the whole subject is the return of Christ. I truly believe you're living in the generation that shall see and witness the return of Christ. So therefore... If you know the truth, it's very important to our Father. He's got something for you. He has a blessing for you, number one, but he also has work for you to make a stand, to make a difference. One person can make a big difference in people's lives. You can. When you set that example, when you do it God's way, you see, we've got the hammer. You know why? Because when we do it God's way, God has already promised you that he would establish you, that he'll make it work for you. But you've got to do it his way. There's, I guess maybe there's three ways. There's, um, there's people's way, and there's the wrong way, and there's God's way. I, I'm going to, I choose God. Because mainly I want his blessings, and he's, he's, he's the one in charge. And I, I want to have that peace of mind and that happiness 
and you gain that by doing it God's way. Paul is a fantastic teacher, and I hope you realize the depth that he has gone to in this particular chapter, that he has given you not only the chronological order of events that consummate the end of this age, that's to say bring it to an end, but he has instructed as to what you should look for, what you should do, and also how to get along with your family while it's happening. And most of all, if you do it that way, you've got God's blessings. He will touch you. That was promised. Do you remember it? And God wants to touch you. You know why? You're his child. He loves you. He wants to take you in his arms and hold you. He wants you to have good. So think about it. Please him. He will always please you. Verse 17. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. Paul kind of signed it himself. Paul usually had Luke to do his scribeship for him because he didn't write too good. Uh, because I, I, my own opinion, and it's, oh, that's all it is, and that's what it's worth, my opinion, is that the thorn that was in his side was his eyesight. And I think that's why he couldn't write real well. So he wrote real large, okay? 18, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Do you know what amen means? That's that. That's the way it is. And there ain't no more. That's it. You can do it his way or you can suffer in the world. It's up to you. This is a book that should be paramount in every Christian's mind in this generation of the fig tree because the subject is the return of Christ to this earth and our gathering back to him. Never forget Paul's tender pleading and reasoning, the wisdom that he placed within it when he geared back whereby a small child can understand. For there's many false teachers in the world today, either deliberately or in ignorance, which I have no idea, and I will not judge men. But I do know what God's Word says. And I will repeat Paul's words in the first verse of the second chapter, 2 Thessalonians. Beloved, I want to talk to you about our gathering back to Christ and His coming to us. That's pretty plain, isn't it? Don't let my first letter deceive you. That's where most of people get the rapture theory in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. All he was talking about is where the dead are. They're, they're with Christ, and he's going to bring them back with him. There's no way we living can precede them. Why? They're already there. But then he continues in that second chapter, and he stipulates very clearly there, there is, don't let that first letter deceive you, some spirit or any man that Christ will not gather back to us or we to him until after the son of perdition stands in the holy place claiming to be Christ, claiming to be God. I don't know, are you all set for that? Now let me slip a little truth to you here. Do you know the reason there were only two churches out of the seven and second and third revelation chapters, that is, that Jesus was happy with? He said, the rest of them, probably you're not going to make it. Five out of seven. He says, probably you're, I've got a lot against you. But two he was happy with. Do you know the one thing those two had in common? Was knowing about the synagogue of Satan, which is to say the son of perdition standing in the holy place claiming to be Christ. And he stipulates in chapter three of, sec of third, uh, chapter three of the book of Revelation in the 10th verse, learn the key of David, find it, use it. It'll unlock scriptures for you that no one can close. And God will touch you and you will have the victory. So it's a fantastic book as I stated. Don't let some joker come along in the seventh verse of that second chapter and tell you, only he who letteth will let till he be taken. That's, that's our church right there, this little old denomination. Just write our denomination in there. Their denomination couldn't turn back an evil spirit, much less 
Satan himself, and I'm not judging them, I just know. All you have to do is watch them and listen. Do they teach God's Word? No. In large part, some of them do. But it's a transitive verb. You get a little scholarship about yourself. It's a transitive verb whereby you must supply the object, the article as well. And it must revert back to the fourth verse to pick up the son of perdition, meaning Satan. And, you know, your companion Bible will help you in this. A Webster's Dictionary. Look up the word transitive verb, the word transitive. It applies both to, to, as to a linguist as well as it is a term that is used also in um, numerics. Uh, I should say uh, arithmetic, math, better said. But as it is used to, by linguists, and then it'll remove all that guesswork for you. Stop, think, absorb God's Word. I hope you enjoyed First and Second Thessalonians. We'll be taking up a new book in our next lecture, and um, which will be following Holy Communion taken for Passover of this year in the very next meeting, all right? If you're listening to this in the live portion, be sure you have the ingredients at the next broadcast. Okay, that's it. Amen, that's that. Have a good day, all right? Listen a moment, won't you please?